Hi everyone, I'm Tracy Smith from Finding Physics, and today I want to talk to you about the difference in between SI and US measurement systems. Um, lots of information here, and before I can even get into the topic of the, the word I keep using here is units, um, I'm going to first define units and then talk about these two different systems, when they're used, and what you can do if you have information in one system but need to change it over into another. So let's get started today by defining what a unit is. So whenever you have to describe a measurement, a quantity, you need to let the reader and record for yourself what measurement scale you're using for when you take the measurement. For example, if I wanted to say how far somebody lived from my house, I wouldn't just say they live three from my house. Yeah, three. Three what? <laughs> right? You, three miles, three kilometers, three blocks, three houses. Unless you know what measurement scale is being used, that number is useless. Um, so for this, you would have to make sure you include the unit of measurement. And whenever I say units, I'm just kind of shortening that, that term unit of measurement. So instead you would say they live three miles from my house where miles is the unit of measurement. So now it's clear to the reader, oh, you know, that's what they were using. It's not just some random number three. We need to know three of what. So anytime I use the term unit, that's what I'm talking about. The unit of measurement used whenever you are addressing a certain quantity. Now, whenever we are in physics class, the majority of quantities that we talk about have units, but they don't all. Uh, this may be confusing. Most times, folks, whenever we have a quantity that doesn't have a unit with it, most of the times it's actually a ratio that that quantity is identifying. So I have a couple examples here on the screen uh, of two quantities that we use in a physics class that don't have units with them, or maybe some people would say there's a unit of one. So this first one here, this is a Greek letter mu, and it stands for the coefficient of friction. And there are different types of coefficient of friction, but right now I'm just using a generic term. And to calculate the coefficient of friction, you take a frictional force divided by a normal force. Now, you don't need to know what all this means right now. What I do want to point out is notice that whenever I have this, I'm taking a force here and I'm dividing it by another force. So the unit of measure for both of those would be the same. It's a Newton. Again, you don't need to know that yet. But if I take a Newton divided by a Newton, they will cancel each other out, leaving just kind of the number one there. So technically, we typically just say, oh, the coefficient of friction doesn't have a unit. It's just that number because it is a ratio. And something similar happens if you look over to the right here, this letter N, okay, that represents the index of refraction or the refractive index. And uh, if we, you take a look at the equation, the C in the numerator is the speed of light in a vacuum. The V in the denominator deals with the speed of light in a specific material. Uh, again, not all important now, but notice that I said speed for C and I said speed for V. So they would be measured, those speeds would be measured in the same units and those units would cancel each other out uh, just turn to the value one. And so that index of refraction for whatever materi material we're looking at uh, would not have units. So most of the time, especially when we're taking measurements, there are indeed units that we have to include. Uh, sometimes when we're talking about other quantities, uh, you may not have units associated with them and that's okay. But it doesn't happen too often. The majority of the time we are dealing with uh, units, so make sure you know what they are and you include them. Now, here's the, the heart of today. 
there are two different systems of measurement that are the main ones right now in the world. Okay. One of those systems is called the SI system, often called the metric system. And this was first adopted in France in 1795. And later, a lot of other countries followed suit and adopted this system as their unit of measurement. The other main system used right now is known as the US customary system. Now this system is derived from the English system. It was brought over here um, to the United States whenever the United States kind of was founded. And it started with the English system. And then over time, some little changes were made and it kind of evolved into what's now known as the US customary system. Uh, there's also the imperial system that evolved from this English system. The U.S. customary system is unique. It has its differences from the English and the imperial system, but you'll notice a lot of similarities. So that's kind of why I put it in parentheses there. Now, this is, <laughs> this is a topic that I could talk a little bit about. Um, I definitely have my opinion on this. And if you want to hear more of my opinion on these different systems and what this screen shows, you can tune into my podcast, the Finding Physics podcast, because I think it's going to be my next uh, topic that I discuss. Because if you look at this map, every country in the world has adopted the metric system as their official measurement system for their country except the United States, Liberia, and Myanmar. And I, from what I read, Myanmar is in the process of going through uh, and changing to the metric system, which they call metrication or metrification. And so from what I read, it seems like they are working on that process. So that would kind of leave US and Liberia as the only countries in the world that haven't adopted the metric system. Now, in the United States, people could voluntarily adopt the metric system. And maybe uh, if you've ever taken medicine, a lot of times when we get our medicine, it's in the metric system. And when we go to some doctor's office, it's in the metric system. Some industries um, have just used the metric system instead of the U.S. customary system. But right now, where that leaves the people in the U.S., is you kind of need to know both systems. And again, I could rant on forever and ever about this, but we'll leave that for my podcast and stick to these systems and the science here. So let's look at these two different systems. First, talking about the metric system. The way the metric system was designed was that it was built off of seven fundamental units. Okay, seven fundamental units. What that means is that they use these seven units as the backbone of all other measurements. So we'll take a look over here. It, when they measure mass, mass is measured in a kilogram. Length measured in meter, time measured in seconds, temperature measured in Kelvin, though Celsius does pop in there sometimes, but Kelvin is the fundamental unit for temperature. Um, electric current, Ampere is the, the unit, luminous intensity, kind of like a brightness, candela, and then the amount of a substance, and you may remember this from chemistry, mole. So these seven terms were defined on what they meant in any other measurement is based off of a combination of these. <clears throat> so it, depending on what it is you're measuring, it might be, you know, a meter divided by a second or a kilogram. So you combo these different units to make other units. Now, those other units are called derived units. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And as you go through the school year, you will hear more of these. You don't have to know them all up front, but things like a Newton. A Newton is just a combination of a kilogram times a meter divided by second squared. But instead of always saying kilogram times meter divided by second squared, they call that combo of units a Newton. So it's kind of like 
a nickname when you have a big cluster of these fundamental units. So that's what a derived unit is. It makes life so much easier, guys, if you know what the terminology means. So that's what the terms fundamental units and derived units mean for the metric system, the SI system. Okay, so that's the one system, and that's the system that's used by the majority of the world. This system does work off of prefixes, and I'm going to have a couple more mini lessons just about the metric system. Right now, I'm just kind of introducing it, and I'm not getting into the nitty-gritty details. So the other system is the U.S. customary system. Now, I didn't put all of the measurements here. They don't kind of have the, the fun, uh, short list of fundamental units for the U.S. customary system, but I've included some that you would be using um, frequently or maybe you use commonly every day if you're in the United States. And so if we take a look for temperature, we typically use Fahrenheit. And uh, of course, that's different than Celsius or Kelvin. For weight, we use the pound. Now the pound can be confusing. Um, here I'm talking about the pounds going along with a force, which is weights, but sometimes people use pounds to talk about mass, which causes a little confusion, I think, sometimes. But pound is something we use a lot in the U.S. customary system, and that's for weight. Length, we might use inch, we might use foot, yard, mile. These are all different terms used to measure length depending on if you're talking about a small length or a really big length. Uh, and you kind of need to know how these things relate to each other if you're trying to compare a bunch of things. So if you are familiar with inches or you had something in inches and you needed to know how many feet, if you had a whole bunch of inches, you need to know the relationship in between inches and feet. Okay, for time we have seconds. And then volume, there's a long list here, teaspoon, tablespoon, cup, pint, ounce, quart, gallon. These are all different ways that we often reference volume depending on if it's a very small volume, it's a, if it's a larger volume. And again, you would need to kind of know the conversions between these if you're trying to go from one to another. So this is the U.S. customary system and some, not all, of the units that are found in this system. Now, what happens is we live in this big world and our world that we live in is very global, right? We're, we're trading, we're importing and exporting. So now we have different places using different measurement systems and sometimes you need to convert from one to the other in order to communicate with somebody else or to design something with certain specifications. So you need to understand what the relationship is in between one measurement system and the other. So I have a very short list here that shows you conversion factors from metric to US customary. Now, depending on what type of reference list you have. You have to pay special attention to how the columns are titled uh, to make sure you're getting the right relationship. So if you take a look here, I have length on the left and I'm telling you a meter in metric. And then if I look here at the top, it says equals in US customary units, 3.281 feet. So if you go to the bottom of the screen, another way I could write that is that one meter is equal to 3.281 feet. That's what that's saying in that table. And then there's more information, right? I have meters to inches. Um, for mass here, I have kilograms to pound mass. And for force, I have newtons to pound force. I always found this a little confusing that sometimes pounds we're talking about mass, sometimes we're talking about force, but a lot of times people will just say pounds and you're kind of like, is that pound mass? Is that pound force? Um, I think that's a shortcoming there. Uh, for pressure, in the metric, we use pascals. In the customary units, it would be PSI, and you can see that one pascal is equal to 1.450 times 10 to the negative fourth PSI, uh, pounds per square inch. And then down here I have temperature. 
So we talk about Kelvin. Now this is a little different. Instead of just having one number, uh, there's a little equation to calculate from Kelvin to Fahrenheit and then also from degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit. So it's not just one conversion. You have to do a little calculation there to convert. So here are some relationships that are frequently used if you're trying to go in between these two different systems. It's almost like two different languages, guys, and we have to be able to translate in between the two different languages. So I think the best way to give you a little taste of this is to do a few examples. And I'm going to do three examples here just to show you how you may convert from one to another. And that term, and I had it on the previous page of what I'm doing on this screen, is known as dimensional analysis. So that's the word that kind of goes along with what I'm doing here. I'm switching from one unit to another unit using this process. You probably use this in a chemistry class if you've already had chemistry so you're familiar with it but I'm just trying to make sure that when we're entering a physics class we're all on equal playing grounds here I'm not going to assume that you already learned this in another class I'm going to show you what you need to know for physics class um, and give you a brief introduction to it here so here's my first example let's say I measured the width of a room and I measured it in feet and I said, okay, the width of this room is 14 and a half feet. All right. But I wanted to know, I needed to know what that was in meters. So if you take a look at the top of the screen, I've only included three conversion factors. We're pretending like these are the only three things that we know, these three conversion factors. But lucky me, I have here the relationship in between feet and meters. So... I want to go from feet and I want to switch it to meters. So here's the dimensional analysis process. I'm going to show you two different ways to write it out that are the same. The way I learned is that you kind of write a little multiplication sign and then you're going to do a ratio next to it. Now this 14.5 feet is the same as 14.5 feet over one. So sometimes people feel better kind of writing that as a fraction, but there's really nothing in the denominator. It's just a one there and we don't usually show it. Now, one meter is the same as 3.281 feet. So if I did one meter divided by 3.281 feet or 3.281 feet divided by one meter, that's just a factor of one. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to multiply 14 and a half feet by one of those two ratios. So maybe I'll write it down here in a different color so you can see my two options to multiply this as a factor of one. I could either do one meter divided by 3.281 feet or I could do 3.281 feet divided by one meter. These are both the same thing, they're equivalent to one because they mean the same thing. They're equal to each other. So I can put one of those right here and that's okay because it's just like I'm multiplying that number by one. Which one do I use though? Well, I'm trying to get rid of feet and have my answer only in meters. So I want the feet to cancel out. So if I want feet to cancel out, I would want to get the ratio that has feet on the bottom. So now if I put that up here and I say one meter divided by 3.281 feet, okay, I can see that when I do that, the feet here would cancel out the feet in the denominator. So now my last step is that I'm going to multiply across the top and divide by whatever's in the bottom. So I have 14.5 times 1. So that would just be 14.5 in my numerator. And then I look in my denominator Well, I have a 1 here. And then I have 3.281 there. So I'm going to do my numbers first. I'll go through and calculate out what I have there. And when I do this in my calculator and I put 14.5 divided by 3.281, 
I get a number that is about 4.42. Oh, that's horrible. 4.42. And the units, if you look at my units now, the feet canceled. So my unit that I have here is just meters. So my answer is 14.42 meters using that dimensional analysis. A quick note, <laughs> I rounded my answer here. This is not how it showed up on my calculator. I rounded it. This is a whole nother lesson, folks, that you could look at at another time, how you know how to round your answers properly. And um, it is important. Uh, and I will go over it in another session, but maybe make a note to yourself, grab a little post-it note, pause this video, write down to yourself, hey, rounding answers, how do I know how to do that? And we need to make sure you look that up either through me or somewhere else so that you know how to properly round your answers when you're doing calculations. And again, it is an important thing. Okay, so this is my first example here on doing dimensional analysis on how you can convert from here. We started with the US customary units in feet and we converted it to meters. So if you get a problem where your units are in one system and you need to convert to another, now we know how to do it. Okay, let's take a look at another example. Let me get rid of some of this here. All right, hold on here, folks. There we go. And let's go and take a look at another example for us. All right. So my next example is an example maybe if I'm looking at tire pressure. So I have to make sure my tires are filled up properly. And I look and see that it says my tire pressure should be 32 PSI. Okay. So 32 PSI, PSI stands for pounds per square inch, but here we just use the notation PSI altogether to stand for pounds per square inch. And over here to the right, I have a nice ratio for you. And let's say I needed to know how many Pascals that's equivalent to. So I know it's 32 PSI now. I told you that I was going to show you another way to kind of set this up instead of doing the multiplication symbol. Another way people will often do dimensional analysis is they make a big horizontal line, okay, and then they do these vertical lines to break it up. So it's still like it is um, set up as a fraction. So I have 32 over 1. And then we go through and we're going to do our conversion. So I want to go from PSI to Pascals. And I know this ratio over to the right, that one Pascal is equivalent to 1.450 times 10 to the negative four PSIs. So if I want to multiply 32 PSI by a ratio, I could either do one Pascal over the PSI amount or vice versa. And we have to figure out which one makes more sense if I want to convert PSI into Pascals. Well, it's going to make more sense, and I'm just going to show the units first, if the PSI, pounds per square inch, is on the bottom so they can cancel, that would mean Pascals go up top. So this is how I usually do it. I set up my units first, and then I take my attention back up here to where the relationship is and I say, okay, the one is with the Pascal and then I have to put 1.450 times 10 to the negative fourth PSI. I'm gonna pause here for a moment, folks, because this 1.450 times 10 to the negative four PSI, that format for writing a number is referenced to a scientific notation. This may be another spot where you want to jot down on a piece of paper, especially if this does not look familiar with you, that you need to look into this a little further. And again, I'll have a mini lesson on this later, that you can use scientific notation to express really, really small numbers or really, really big numbers without having to write an endless amount of numbers or zeros to express the number. So that's what we have here. We have this value written in scientific notation. 
1.450 times 10 to the negative 4. And uh, again, something that we need to make sure we understand as we go through a physics class. So now I'm going to come back here and draw my next vertical line if I wanted to. I actually don't even need a vertical line because right now I'm just ready to calculate because my pounds per square inch here cancels out my pounds per square inch there and now I can just enter this in a calculator. So I would grab my calculator, I would type in 32 divided by Oh, this is another thing. Very helpful to know how to enter a number that is in scientific notation into your calculator. So I'm going to take a moment. I think this is worth addressing right now. Anytime you do division in your calculator, it's helpful that you put parentheses around whatever's in the denominator, especially if you're multiplying multiple numbers in the denominator. When you're dealing with scientific notation, there are many ways you could type this into your calculator. A lot of students who are starting feel the need to type the number one, then a decimal point, then four, five, zero, then the times button, then a one, then a zero, then an up arrow for um, a superscript, then a negative, then a four. Don't do that. It, first of all, it takes forever. That's so many buttons that you need to push there. And if you don't have parentheses around that whole quantity there in the denominator, your calculator is going to misunderstand your order of operations if you don't include the parentheses. There is a simpler way to do it. The best way to type a number in scientific notation in your calculator, for example, um, oh, maybe I'll just say it instead of writing it. Take a, Grab a calculator, pause this video, grab a calculator so you can look at it and see what it is that I'm talking about. Okay, have your calculator. So what you want to do is you want to type 32 divided by, I know you got that part, then type 1.450. Now, this is the educational part here. Hit the second button and then EE. -E. The EE -E is above the comma on my calculator. Maybe your calculator is a little different, but we want the EE -E button. The EE -E button on your calculator is a replacement for times 10 to the, and it's waiting for the exponent. So now you typed in 1.45 EE, -E, all you have to type in now is negative 4. Okay, because it's like waiting. This is a placeholder here, just waiting for what's coming next. So you just took out having to type times one, zero, up caret. And even better, your calculator understands that EE -E means that it's a part of the numbers before it. So you could get away without putting the parentheses. Uh, and this is one of the reasons I think it's very helpful for students because if you forget the parentheses, but you typed it in your calculator this way, you would still get the right answer. Okay, we'll focus more on that as time goes by, folks. Uh, the answer that you would get in your calculator when you type this in should be about 2.2 .2 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. Again, you were probably saying, hey, that's not what it looked like on my calculator. There were a whole bunch of digits. What I'm doing here is I'm trying to follow the rules on how to properly report an answer following the significant figures and the numbers that are being used in the calculation. Again, I didn't talk to you about this. Maybe this is something you've never heard of before, but it's something you need to know how to properly round answers. So the only way that I could kind of do this in a reasonable manner was to write my answer in scientific notation and make sure I included the right amount of significant figures. Again, that's for another lesson, but there you go. That's the answer we get for this. So I converted from PSI to Pascal's. I went from one measurement system to another. Now I have one last example, and this one's just to kind of mess with you a little bit. I'm not going to lie, just to show you how um, complex some of these conversions can be. When we're talking about dimensional analysis, depending on what information you have, um, 
it can get it can get a little interesting and seem a little long. So let let's do a a fun one. Again, this is probably something you would never do for multiple reasons, but it's just a practice in the process. So let's say I was driving at 40 feet per second. So I'm giving this in the US customary units. So I am driving at 40 feet per second. Now, notice I put that little decimal point after the zero and 40. I'm trying to show you that I know that it is exactly 40. Uh, again, this is a little notation that we use um, in science a lot to, to signify, hey, even though it's a zero there, I'm just trying to let you know that I know that that zero was really an actual zero. That's another lesson in itself too, uh, dealing with significant figures in different notations. All right, so what am I asking you to do here? I'll write it up at the top so we don't forget. We're trying to go from feet per second to miles per hour. Feet per second to miles per hour. Hmm. Now, really I'm staying within the US customary units, but according, we're pretending here, that the only conversions I know are these three, which this last one is irrelevant to this problem. So I only know these two conversions. I know the relationship in between meters and feet and miles and meters. So right now I don't have the luxury of going from feet to miles directly because, well, I just don't know that conversion. Again, I know you could look it up. Um, but I'm just trying to give you an example of the process here. But what I do know how to do is I know how to go from feet to meters. And then I know the relationship in between meters and miles. So I can kind of combo first changing from feet to meters, then changing from meters to miles. So let's take a look at what that might look like. I'm going to do my big horizontal line here, maybe. All right, that's supposed to be a horizontal line. There we go, thank you. Um, and then I'm gonna do my little vertical line there. So I started off with feet per second. So the first thing I'm gonna do, and I said for this weird problem that I made up, um, we're gonna use this relationship so I can change from feet to meters. I'm really trying to get the miles, but meters is gonna be my middleman here. So I'm going to write down my feet need to be on the bottom. So I have my rate relationship that 3.281 feet is equivalent to one meter. So I wanted feet on the bottom because I need the feet to cancel, right? I need the feet to cancel out. So now this foot canceled that foot. So I have meters now in my numerator. That's good but I don't want meters in my numerator. I'm trying to get to miles in the numerator. So now I stop and think, okay, how can I get to miles? Well, right, right here, I have the relationship in between meters and miles. So I can use that conversion. So that's gonna be my next step. Which one do I put on the bottom? Well, I need the meters to cancel. So I wanna make sure that I have meters on the bottom and miles on the top. So I have, according to my little rate relationship above, one mile is equivalent to 1609.34 meters. All right, we're making progress. We're making progress because now the meters have canceled and I have miles in the numerator. Check, that's looking good. But if I look in my denominator, the units in my denominator are still seconds. I need to change seconds to hours. I wanted miles per hour. All right, so we're still going. So this is one of those problems that you're like, when does this end? Are you kidding me? But this is a good practice. So I'm happy with miles up top. Now I need to change seconds to hours. And maybe right off the top of your head, you don't know how many seconds are in an hour, but you do know how many seconds are in a minute. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna use your knowledge that there are 60 seconds in one minute. 
That's a, a relationship that you know. So where do I put the seconds? Do I put 60 seconds in the top or in the bottom? Well, I need the seconds to cancel. So I put 60 seconds up top in the one minute on the bottom because I need my seconds to cancel. The seconds down here, cancel the seconds up there. So am I done? Nope, because right now, the way this stands, I have it in miles per minute. That's not what I want. I want miles per hour. So I still have one more conversion to do to get this to where I want it to be. So one last one to go. And now I need to use the relationship in between minutes and hours. Well, that's something I know. I know that there are 60 minutes in one hour. So where do I put the minutes? Well, I can see here that I have minutes in my denominator. So I would want the minutes in the numerator so they can cancel. So I say 60 minutes in one hour. These minutes cancel out those minutes. And finally, if I take a look across my numerator here, I have the units of miles. And then I take a look across my denominator I'm laugh, left with the units of hours. So my units are now what I wanted to convert to miles per hour. So my last step here is that I'm going to plug this all into my calculator. And the way I typically do this is I multiply across the top. So in my calculator, I'm gonna take this entire numerator in parentheses, and I'm gonna say 40 times 60 times 60 and then hit the division sign and I will have a big bunch here in the bottom and in that bottom parentheses in my calculator I would do the 3.281 times 1609.34 and hit the equal sign and it's going to spit out my answer and the number that it spits out is approximately 27 miles per hour. And by the way, a lot of times we write miles per hour, MPH, miles per hour. So that means the same thing. It's worth noting, folks, that there is this little conversion here where we try to go from seconds to hours. And this happens, I don't want to say a lot, but sometimes, I don't know, maybe it's more frequent in a physics class where we need to deal with this conversion. So it is helpful for you to know how many seconds are in an hour. And that is 3,600 or 3,600 seconds in one hour. Yes, that's just multiplying 60 by 60. But um, sometimes it's just a nice quick step for you to take instead of having to do this double uh, conversion in your equations. So we have a lot of examples here. Those were just a few to kind of get you started and to show you how we can convert. I know this last one, I wasn't converted in between, converting in between US and um, metric systems, but just kind of showing you a little conversions in general. So we can use it different ways. Why are units important in physics class? Well, guys, we need to know what we're measuring, what scale it's in, and then when we do calculations, we need to know what units to report our answers in. So you are going to be using units nonstop. You also need to know that if a unit is given in one measurement system, perhaps the US customary system, you may need to convert it into the metric system. Um, I only use the metric system in my science classes. I would think a lot of science classes only use the metric system, though you know maybe your teacher uses a little bit of both systems to expose you to them. Uh, in the real world, what happens is in the United States, we use a mixture of the two systems. And this is something that if you don't pay close attention can be very dangerous, not just because you get a wrong answer on a homework assignment or a test. It can cause in the real world, catastrophic and even fatal errors. And you can see them documented guys, times when uh, a specification was made in the design in one system of measurement, 
but whenever it was actually created, it was done in a different system of measurement. There's a miscommunication. Uh, somebody overlooks something, and there have been fatalities due to this. So going in between these two systems, uh, you need to make sure you're paying attention so that we do not have horrible outcomes. What would I be doing in the finding physics workshop that goes along with this material? Well, lots of practice. We would practice converting from one system to another, maybe doing some more complex and longer conversions. Um, but you are going to be converting all year. I feel like every test that I give a student, I make sure that there's at least one conversion on it somewhere. So you need to become familiar with it and comfortable with it. So if you want to sign up for the workshop that goes along with this, you can go to findphysics.com, sign up for the workshop, or just a tutoring session in general for yourself or for a small group of people. Or if you're just looking for more information, some tips, some inspiration, you could stop by the website, take a look at my blog, uh, visit the podcast the Finding Physics podcast. I mentioned that this topic is one that I get a little heated about and um, I definitely will have a podcast there about the United States and what measurement system we use and uh, my thoughts on that. All right, everyone, have a great day.